Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you're all doing great, as I always say. And in this video, I got stories from Appalachia, from Vermont, from Iowa, and from Northern Canada. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, then definitely pull up a stump and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. So, believe it or not, there was a disappearing house in Thompson, Iowa. I saw it myself back in 2006. I was in town for a few months working. The hours were very long. I was up before dawn normally, and I don't get back to my motel till near sundown. I spend my days off sleeping or watching TV, basically. The point is, is that I didn't really get a chance to see much of the area at all. So on a day off, I decide to take a drive. There's cornfields everywhere. I pass by this one house that really stands out. It's big and white, kind of Victorian looking, with a big wraparound porch. It looks brand new. I'm confused. I pass this area every day on my way to work and I've never seen it before. I figure it's because I'm usually still waking up when I'm heading to work. There is an old lady outside at the mailbox, and I wave to her. She just stares me down the whole time, with a weird look on her face. I think, yeah, whatever. So, fast forward to, I'm heading back to the motel after driving around for a few hours. I'm expecting to see this big white house again. I don't. The whole area is a cornfield again, and I never did see that house again. I remember this was off the 84, right at the border of Iowa and Illinois. Anybody from there ever heard of this? I'm not from there, and I haven't been back since. This is something that happened to me less than a year ago. My father lives in the middle of nowhere in Vermont, in an old ass house with a billion rooms because the original owners in the 1800s had like a billion kids. I've never lived there before. I grew up out west, but I stayed with him for the summer during college. I get offered a normal room or the attic room. I see the attic room and she shows me the house. The attic room is creepy AF. It has this old wrought iron bed next to a window and some child-sized door that's set into the wall. I just think, oh hell no. So I assume that if I slept there, I would wake up to weird noises and the door being opened, and I'm not into that core line BS. I mention the creepy attic bedroom to my mother, my uncle, and friends when I call them because I find it comically creepy. I do lots of work around the house for my father, including putting up insulation in the attic, so I pass by that attic bedroom many, many times. The summer ends, and I go back to college. Nothing creepy happened with the door when I lived there, beyond child-sized doors being inherently creepy. But the story doesn't end there. Flash forward three years. I graduated college, and I'm living in Texas. My father invites me and my girlfriend to visit him in Vermont. I've told my girlfriend about the creepy attic room. I don't want anything to do with ghosts and spooks and all that stuff, but my girlfriend has never had a paranormal experience, and she wants to have one. She pleads that we sleep in the creepy attic bedroom. I really, really don't want to, but I love her, and we compromise on spending one night in the attic bedroom. I ask my father if we can stay in the attic bedroom. He says, uh, sure. You can sleep in the attic if you want to, I guess. We get to Vermont and sleeping in a regular bedroom for the first night. My girlfriend asks if we can go look around the attic and see the attic bedroom. I think, sure. So I grab a flashlight because there's no lights in the attic and I head up to show her the bedroom. We look all over the attic. There's no bed and there's no child sized door. Assume that I've forgotten the spatial layout of the attic and promise to try again come daylight. We go back up the next day. There's still no bedroom and still no child-sized door. And at this point, I'm thinking, hmm, what's going on here? 
My girlfriend is obviously very disappointed and thinks that I've been pulling her leg. I asked my dad about the old bedroom with the child-sized door since I can't find it. He looks at me a little confused. He says, yeah, I didn't really know what you were talking about when you kept mentioning that. I was just joking that you could sleep in the attic because you slept in the basement as a child. He informs me that there has never been a raw attic bed in the attic. He informs me that there was never a child-sized door in the attic. I go back up to the attic and check the room that I remember being the bedroom. I realize that if the door was there, like I remember it being, it would be an exterior wall and thus not be able to go anywhere. I assume at this point that I merely had a vivid hallucination or something, and I apologize for disappointing my girlfriend. Something still doesn't sit right with me though. I call my mother, uncle, and friends and ask them if they remember me talking about the attic at my father's house a few years ago. They all say yes and ask if I mean the bedroom with the creepy child-sized door. And I say, well, yeah, that's what I mean. I was up in the attic, working for hours at a time that summer, and I passed by that room dozens of times. If the bed or the child-sized door were suddenly missing, I would have noticed. Either that, or I had a persistent hallucination of that bedroom for an entire summer. Or, there was a ghost door, and it was a ghost bed that appeared to me then vanished. I'm very glad that I didn't end up sleeping in the attic that first summer and get my ass coralined. So this is a little short one, but it's just as important. One of the watchers or listeners or whatever you can say of the channel had a friend that passed away. He commented on one of the videos and he asked me to use this. So his friend that passed away was named Dwayne and they were really close. So Clarence says, So I was at work today, and I left a heavy meat drawer open, because I was busy, so I was cooking on the grill about five feet from said open drawer. And all of a sudden, it shut. I said, Thank you, Dwayne, and I shed a tear for my friend. I know it was him. So, I decided to use that because it's kind of wholesome in a way. Somebody could have definitely ran into that drawer, so, I think your friend was looking out for you there, Clarence, and, and it's kind of nice, but also still spooky, but it's nice in, like, a way where you know that your friend might still be looking out for you, even though they've passed on. It didn't happen to me, but it happened to my dad, and I don't tell the story very often because he's, like, doesn't want people to know these things happen kind of thing. So anyways, uh, my dad's father, my grandfather, died in 2005, and he was very close with the whole family, and the family is just never the same after he died. And my dad worked swing shift, so, you know, you, you can fall asleep pretty much at any point in time after doing that for 30 years. So he was driving to a meeting one day, like this was not work related, it was a day off, he was driving to a meeting in the city, which is about an hour and a half from where I live. And he fell asleep at the wheel, which didn't usually happen, but it, it can happen to anybody, really. So he falls asleep at the wheel. He remembers just like the his head going down. And then he said he woke up, and it was 20 minutes later, and his truck was pulled off to the side of the road with uh, a song that his dad liked playing. So we both think that his dad was looking out for him that day. So your story just reminded me of that, Clarence. Anyways, I hope you're doing a little better these days. I know how hard a loss can be. So I'm going to keep the details on this pretty vague since the place is still owned by my family but I'd still like some input on what I might have experienced. This is my first time telling this story, so bear with me. This happened in the late 90s when I was a young teenager. We plan a winter getaway trip to northern Canada. My uncle's hunting cabin with a small lake right next to it. It's very idyllic. On the middle of the afternoon, 
It's overcast, but no rain or snow that day. My dad is chopping wood on the shoreline. My cousins and uncle are just screwing around in the woods and shooting beer bottles. Back then was before I was educated on guns, so I was kind of afraid of them. But I still liked being in the wilderness regardless then. I decide to try ice fishing for the first time. The lake is within sight of my family, so they don't care. I go solo, and the ice is thick enough for me to stand on, with a couple centimeters of powdered snow as well. I wander out, and I bust a hole in the ice. This takes a while because, again, I was a young teenager and pretty weak. I end up sitting on my tackle box because I didn't want to go back to the cabin for a stool, and I start fishing with pieces of stale sandwich ham for bait. I keep hearing this quiet slapping noise where I'm sitting, so I just figure that it's the water lapping at the ice underneath of me, so I get my line ready and I cast it out. Every now and then, I'll see something that's whitish gray pass by the hole. I figure it's probably just a weird looking trout. The line will bob every few minutes, and whenever I pull it out, the ham is gone. I sat there in the cold for over an hour and didn't land a single fish. I end up getting pretty bored and uncomfortable because I'm hunched over on this tackle box. I scrape some of the snow and ice off to see if I can even spot any fish. I see the bottoms of bare feet on the other side of the ice for a couple seconds before they step away from the cleared patch, and I think, what in the hell did I just see? It looks like a person walking upside down under the ice. I yell for my family to come over, but they have gone into the cabin already and don't hear me. I'm more curious than scared for some reason. I was a dumb kid, remember? And I also think that it's someone pulling a prank somehow, even though that's impossible. I took off one of my coats and I used it to sweep more snow away. I find the feet again and I step away under the snow, just like before. I could see legs too, but not much else. The water is too dark and the ice is too thick to see anything above the knee. I keep walking forward with the coat, using it kind of like a broom to sweep away in a path. Every time I find the feet, they move further away from the shoreline toward the middle of the lake. I followed the feet for another 10 meters, and suddenly, I feel a deep, sharp, cracking sound. I realize that the ice is a lot thinner here than by the shore. I do a 180, and I power walk back to get my gear, keeping as far away from the fishing hole as I can. While retreating back to shore, I could hear the dim, slapping noise follow me the entire way back. I yelled at my family for leaving me alone when I get back to the cabin. My dad and uncle said that they could see me through the cabin window just fine. I tell them about what I saw, but they all think that I'm lying and just trying to get back at them for leaving me out there. So they start telling ghost stories for the rest of the night to try and freak me out more. But for the rest of the trip, I didn't go near that lake at all. I've heard some Inuit stories of monsters pulling kids under the ice, but we weren't that far north, and this thing had ample opportunity to reach up through the hole to get me, though maybe it was content to just eat my stale lunch ham instead. I don't know. So I was born and raised in Lafayette County, LA, God's country. But my dad's side of the family is all Appalachian mountain folk, 100% American bred country bumpkins, the kind that you can barely understand when they talk to you. Good people though, and great storytellers. I grew up listening wide-eyed to their crazy tales of witches in the mountains and magical things they'd experienced. For example, when I was really young, my dad used to cut our hair. He'd scoop it up and then go out into the woods. I never questioned why this was until one day my youngest brother got his first haircut. As usual, he did it. When he was done, he scooped up the hair like he always did. Grandpa was there at the time and he said, make sure to bury it, and Dad nodded and went out into the woods. 
I was about maybe 10 by this point, and I had never been told that Dad was burying our hair. So I asked about it, and Grandpa said that witches can use your hair to cast spells on you. He says that you gotta go out where no one can see you and dig a hole and bury it. Otherwise, the witches will use it to curse you. Grandpa is shocked that I've never heard that before. He asks, Didn't your dad ever explain how to tell if a witch made a curse out of your hair? I tell him, No, sir. And he explains that witches can put spells on bits of human hair to make a person sick or to make them do things. Occasionally this will result in a hairball. I'm thinking he means like the kind of a hairball that a cat will puke up. But he describes it as a big, tangled up wad of hair. It just appears like out of thin air, wherever you are. It sounds dumb, but he calls my older cousin over. He was staying with us at the time. And he says, Tell this young lad about the time that you found a hairball. My cousin's eyes go wide. He says that one morning when he was at the breakfast table talking to his brother, they were sitting there across from each other when a big wad of hair materialized out of thin air. They watched it appear right in front of their eyes, then it floated over like a tumbleweed toward my cousin. He jumped out of his chair. Those witch balls can burn your skin, he told me. He grabbed a pair of tongs and plucked it out of the air, careful not to touch it. Then, he tossed it in the fire. I asked him if anything ever happened after that. He said no, luckily. I'd asked if he ever been burned by one of those hairballs. He said no, but his friend had. Apparently his friend was out on his farm one day when he heard a cow in the woods. He was thinking that one of his cows escaped, so he went over to bring it back. He followed the mooing until they came to a small clearing, but there was no cow. And then, a bunch of witch balls appeared out of thin air and encircled him. He knew what they were immediately, and he took off running. But he ran into a few on his way out, and the next day, his face, arms, and neck were covered in these big burns. It looked kind of like road rash, actually. My grandpa told me to be careful about my hair after that. And from then onward, I always made sure Dad buried my hair if he cut it. I know it's probably not a true story, or at least there's some other explanation for it, but I still do it myself, you know, just in case that he was telling the truth and it actually is real. This was another one from my grandfather. There's something that happens before some people die. They just call it the knocking. Before someone died, they'd hear a tapping at the front door. The tapping always stopped as soon as someone went to check on it. The next day, somebody in that house would be dead. Sometimes, only the person who was about to die would hear it. But usually, multiple people would hear it. Apparently, it happened to someone in my family one of dad's cousins. He was outside with a bunch of friends and family when they all heard someone pounding on the front door of the house. They looked over and nobody was there. They figured that maybe one of the kids had gone inside and was playing around so they got back to talking. Then the pounding started again and my dad's cousin went over to tell the kids to stop messing around. But nobody was there. He closed the door and began walking toward everybody in the yard while the knocking came again, this time quieter. My dad's cousin looked back. Nobody was there. My grandpa said everyone got spooked because they all knew that this meant a death in the family. The very next day, my dad's cousin was found dead in his bed with no apparent cause of death. And one last one from my grandfather. When my dad was growing up, there was some woman named Miss Adeline or something like that, who everybody knew was a good witch. If people were sick or needed help removing a curse, they'd go to Miss Adeline. One day, Grandpa sent Dad over to Miss Adeline's house to help her chop wood. He worked up a sweat, and Miss Adeline asked if Dad would like some milk. 
He said sure and followed her inside. Miss Adeline checked the fridge, but there was nothing in it. She says, I must have run out. She asked Dad to help her with something really quick and she'll get him some milk. Miss Adeline grabs a little towel and Dad follows her outside. She has this big bundle of sticks tied up next to the house. She grabs the bundle and lays it on a stump and then covers the bundle with the towel. Can you chop these sticks for me? My dad obliges. Only when he brings the axe down, the sticks don't break. Miss Adeline removes the towel, and lo and behold, the bundle of sticks is fine. No damage whatsoever. And then, Miss Adeline grabs a big pail and sets it at her feet. She takes the towel that she used to cover the bundle of sticks and she squeezes. As she wrings it out, a huge twirl of milk comes pouring out of it. She fills up the entire bucket, then she pours out two glasses of fresh milk. My dad takes a sip nervously, then he chugs the entire thing. My dad would tell this part by exaggerating licking his chops and rubbing his belly. He said it was the sweetest glass of milk that he's ever drank. So, what did you think of those stories? Let me know which one was your favorite one down in the comments. Do you have any stories of your own? I have an email address in the description below that you can send them to if you want. And if you want to donate to the channel, there's links down there too. And with that, I hope everybody has a good week, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.